uh, uh, tell you, we're in the series we're calling So Help Me God Week 2, and we're going to get into that in a minute, but I want to just uh, apologize to my wife this morning. We like to have fun around our house, and we have lots of fun, and we, we, we often have what we call Nerf War guns, uh, Nerf Wars. With Nerf guns, anybody got some Nerf guns? Am I the only grown man who's got Nerf guns in this house? I say it's for my five-year-old, but it's really for me. I can reach a Nerf gun at any point within like three foot in my house. At one point, I can grab a gun and shoot you. And we were having a Nerf battle this morning before church, and uh, my wife lost, uh, shot her right in the eye. So now she kind of almost looks like Popeye if you look at her, right? <laughs> so I just want to say, Swear, I'm sorry. I apologize. You lost. You shouldn't have. You, it was your, really your fault. You got in the way of it. But, uh, but I won. Did I say that? I won. Me, victorious. So uh, there, I'll probably got a sabotage waiting at some point. But anyway, we're going into week two of So Help Me, God. And, and I want to talk to you last week, if you weren't here, if maybe this is your first time with us, Pastor Brandon kicked us off. This is a series that you, this is, you're in the driver's seat. We allowed you to ask questions of really what would you like us to teach on? What topic would you like us to talk about? And you are asking this, the questions and we're preaching on your ideas, your thought processes all month long. And Last week, you asked the question of how do I overcome temptation? And I believe really Pastor Brandon brought one of the most, one of the more powerful words on that topic that I've ever heard and just some really good practical uh, lessons from God's word on how to do that. And I would encourage you to go back online and listen to that or watch that message on video if you've got time this week because it really was uh, a powerful word. And today, I want to talk to you, ask the question, a lot of you ask the question regarding this topic is how do I stay purity? How do I stay pure even when sex is everywhere? How do I walk in purity in a culture where everywhere I look, sex is there and it sells, the bio, uh, it, 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 sex sells greater than anything else on earth. Did you know that sex is a $5 billion a year industry? Sex sells more than the NFL, the MLB, ho uh, National Hockey League, and NBA all combined. More money uh, is, is, goes through the process of sex being sold in the United States alone than any other industry. The unfortunate thing about that is scripturally is sex is something that was never supposed to be sold. It was never supposed to be something that was ever going to be for sale. It was a priceless thing that God created for us in the context of marriage. And I want to talk to you today talk about this topic and we want to kind of handle it with kid gloves. So it's going to be more of a serious talk. I want you to understand that really think of it as us talk, sitting together at a coffee table in a coffee house or maybe a, in your living room across from one another. And this is just a conversation that we're having together about this topic because I believe the two things that I believe the enemy has used in our culture and my generation more than any other thing is the love of money and the idea of sex can uh, is anything you want it to be. Uh, sex promiscuity in our culture and in our day and age. I really believe those two things have been twisted more than any other thing in our culture against the will of God. And I just want to talk to us today a little bit about how can I stay pure in a culture that is so anti-purity. When really, when you think of the word purity in our culture, it's kind of billed as it's archaic, it's old, it's out of date. Nobody thinks that way anymore. And most of us, when we think of that word, we probably think just like Jeremiah did in the book of Lamentations. If you've got your notes, they're in your worship guide. You can pull those out and you can follow along with me this morning. I want to read this verse because I don't know if you're like me, if you're like I am, this is a lot of, this is how I feel when I think of purity. When I, when I think of that word and I look at my own life and the decisions that I've made, I can, I can fall very quickly into this thought process. And Jeremiah says it in Lamentations chapter three, he says, I remember my affliction and my wandering with the, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. So I, I really do, I can resonate with his idea of thinking through that process when he thinks of purity and walking with God and purity and the decisions that we've made in our own lives. When I think about that and I think about my past, I kind of walk into this season of depression and go, man, I really messed up. I made some huge mistakes. And, but I want to remind us today through the process of this message, the rest of this verse, and he says, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Maybe you want to underline that. There is hope. There's 
People sitting in here who have probably walked through every uh, bad decision sexually and morally and ethically and all of those different ideas when we talk about purity, we've probably all walked through every one of them and we've all walked through the, pre the depression of realizing that uh, it didn't honor God and it's messed up our lives. But I want us to know today that there is hope in the process of it all because, the, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, Great is your faithfulness. Now listen, this is a, a passage of scripture. The book of Lamentations is not a pretty book. It's not a pretty picture of what's going on in the life of Israel. This is a, a, a depiction. The Bible talks literally Lamentations. He is lamenting over what God has done, over what's happened because of the decisions that these people have made. And, and he's lamenting over what, what is the consequences of what's going on because of their decisions. But he says, even in the process of it all, I find out hope in the faithfulness of God. We're not completely consumed because his compassions never fail. So I want to pray this morning and I want us to understand a few things in God's, in, 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 through, through the word of God, of the, the realization, some things we need to realize when it comes to purity. And then I want to give us, before we leave today, a few ways that we can just practical steps that we can take to walk in purity, even in a culture that's surrounded uh, with the opposite of what that is biblically. So let's just pray together and then we'll dive into our notes. Father, we love you. God, we honor you today and we thank you so much. God, that we don't have to do this on our own. God, your word gives us clear uh, instruction God, uh, breathed by you. God, the Bible teaches us that, that it is God breathed and it's for our instruction, it's for our correction, it's for our inspiration. God, it's, we're not here having to make decisions on our own apart from you and hoping that it pleases you. But Father, you've given us very clear instruction on what honors you. And I pray that today that we would drop all of our preconceived ideas at the foot of the cross today and we would pick up your will, your purpose, your plan for our life. And God, we would live it on purpose in a way that honors you. God, I pray that you would uh, open our minds and open our hearts and we would receive what you've got to tell us today in Jesus name. Amen. So some things we need to realize, how do I walk in purity in a world where sex is everywhere? The first thing I need to realize is sex as you know it is a lie. Sex as you know it is a lie. That's the biggest, I, I really believe this, the biggest thing that I need to realize in a world that is consumed with sex everywhere we go. You can't go to the grocery store aisle, purchase anything without it being sold on any form of a magazine. How many, I mean, Lord, how many lists are they going to come up with uh, of, of how to make your sex life better and all these different things? I mean, it's a new one every month for the last forever. It's everywhere you look, all the places. So, I need to realize that the, what I see around me is a total lie. And when I realize and understand that it's all a lie, it makes it that much easier for me not to buy into it. But the problem is this. The problem is even us as believers in Christianity in America, if we were fully honest with ourselves, we don't 100% believe that it's a lie. Because we don't 100% believe it's a lie, that's why it's so easy for us to walk into it. That's why we ask questions like, how do I walk in purity? when sex is everywhere because we're not 100% sure with our own self and convinced that it's all a lie and it's easy to buy into that when we don't understand it as a complete lie. If you've got a friend and you know they're 100% telling you a lie, what do you do? You don't trust them. You don't buy into it. You probably don't hang around them. You probably realize that you can't trust what they're saying. But the truth is we haven't really bought completely that it's a lie, but it is. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 13 that on, to honor marriage, a word for word translation tells us this. The actual literal translation is marriage should be honored above everything. The greatest thing that you can have in a in, in, in our culture in mind is uh, the, the, the best of the best representation of the gospel is marriage, okay? And he says, honor marriage and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between wife and husband. And then it says, God draws a firm line against casual and illicit sex. God in his word draws a firm line against anything 
casual and illicit outside of marriage. And we need to realize that anything else sold in any other capacity as, as any other thing sexually, it's a lie. It's all completely a lie of the enemy to, uh, sold to us to pull us apart from a relationship with God. The Bible teaches us that God designed sex to be enjoyed in the contents of marriage. So I need to understand the first thing I need to realize is sex as I know it is a lie. And when I realize that, I'll understand, number two in your notes, that purity isn't bondage. Purity isn't bondage. See, culture around us teaches us that that sex is, is not, what bi not what biblical principles teach us. And they would also teach you that purity is archaic. It's old. It's uh, old school. It's, it's nothing in, in what, what purity is outlined is really what people do today. No one lives that way and neither should you. You should be able to do what you want to do and enjoy life exactly how you want to enjoy it and leave everything, else, uh, al leave everything else alone. Do what you want. But listen to what 1 Corinthians 6 teaches us. It says, run from sexual sin. Run from it. Pastor Brandon talked about temptation last week, talked about running from temptation. And this one even saying, hey, run from the even act. The, the, the Greek word is porneia. It's where we get the word pornography. But literally that word encompasses any form of sexual sin, any form. That's pornography, that's adultery, that's sex outside of marriage, any form of sexual sin, run from it. And he tells us why. He says, no other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. And then he goes on to tell believers, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Now there may be people in here who aren't believers, and there may be people in here who haven't really fully trusted in Jesus. And you probably ha have heard this or have said, I can do what I want. It's my body. I can do what I want. And the truth is you have that decision to make because you can. But as a believer, there's something that we've done. The Bible teaches us that Christ has bought us with a high price. We don't belong to ourselves. The decisions we make are decisions we're making based on the person who owns us. And the Bible says that we are, we are, we are owned by Christ. We are not our own. We were purchased with a high price. So as believers, we have to submit who we are, the decisions we make, and the lives that we live to the person who bought us with such a high price price. So purity isn't bondage. He's giving it to us for our protection. So we need to understand purity is not to restrict us. It is completely to protect us. Purity is not just to restrict you from having a good time in your life. It's not just to restrict you from uh, enjoying life. And uh, it's quite really the opposite. It's, protect, it's to protect you from all of the, the, the hidden agenda of the enemy in your life regarding sexual purity. Did you know this, that the average person who is sexually active outside of marriage is sexually active with at least a minimum of eight different partners. Eight different partners, the average person is sexually active with outside of marriage. That means this, you're sexually active with a person who has been sexually active with eight other people and those eight other people have been sexually active with eight other people. Can you understand the ramifications of the possibilities of what could happen to you physically and emotionally and everything else involved when you're sexually active outside of marriage? It's a big deal. It's not for your restriction. God says, I see the big picture and it's for your protection. Purity isn't bondage. It's to give you freedom. How many people do you know? How many people do you know who have been sexual, sexually active outside of marriage, just in your circle of influence, who have gotten the news one day that oh no, I've got some sort of sexual transmitted disease or oh no, I'm pregnant and I didn't, didn't see that coming. My life plans have now changed forever and all of these different ideas and thoughts, all of it is because God is saying walk in purity. It's not bondage, it's for your protection. And when we realize it's not bondage, we need to understand this. Number three, that passion isn't bad. Passion isn't bad. Because here's what we've been taught our whole life. We've been taught the whole thing about sex, that it's, we've been taught this in church, that sex is bad. That don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Don't even talk about it. If you're like me in the home that I grew up in, I don't think to this day I've ever heard any of my parents even utter the word 
sex. I may have heard my mom spell it one time, one time at some point or another. But nobody's ever said it. And when it was even portrayed or even talked about, like it was redirected. Like we don't want to have that conversation. And I'm sure at some point my parents were like, we need to have the conversation. But then I turned 20 and they were like, he's already got it figured out by now, I guess. So like, it never got talked about, okay? Nobody ever discussed it. And probably that's true in your home. What you know about purity and what you know about sexuality, you probably figured out from the culture around you. The problem is it's all a lie. No. None of it is true according to God's word. So the knowledge that we have is, is, is a complete lie. So we've been told that, that we've, been, we've learned what sex is. So when, because we've been taught what sex is through culture, our parents teach us and, fam- and church teach us that, that it's a bad thing. So don't even do it. And, and the only thing that they talk about purity, if you're going to walk in purity, the only way you walk in purity is to completely deny any other any other form of passion in your heart or your mind, just don't do it. Suppress it, suppress it, suppress it. Don't worry about it. And that has resulted in an overwhelming, uh, actually rebellion is what we would call it, against God's word. And the truth is, it's probably not rebellion. It's just they need to, they need to understand that passion isn't a bad thing. It just needs some parameters. So I want to show you with an illustration. I saw a pastor do this about a year and a half ago, and I just thought it was really the best illustration uh, regarding our passions and regarding uh, sexual purity and all these uh, ideas and thoughts. So he's going to bring some wood up here and we're going to go ahead. There you go. That's good. We're going to go ahead and start a fire here today just to kind of illustrate. Does anybody like fires in here? I'm a big fire fan. There's my fire right here. I love fire. When I was a kid, I would find lighters and I would just light things. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? I mean, I would just, it, it, it's fun to light a fire. Anybody else, anybody like fires in here? I love them. I love fires. I love fire. I love campfires and bonfires. When I was a teenager, we would, we would uh, camp out in the woods and we would cut down, we would cut down uh, trees and we would see how tall we could get the fire. We uh, gotten ourselves in a good bit of trouble that way. Uh, so I'm going to start a fire today because I want to illustrate how cool fires can be, because they are cool. Everybody likes them, right? So the exit's right there in the middle if you get scared at any point. It's a small opening, so you might want to be the first one there, okay? So if we light this fire in here on this platform, what do you think's going to happen? Well, there we go. What do you think's going to happen? If I lit it right now, it would begin to grow, and unfortunately, it would singe the carpet, burn the whole place down. There'd be some metal on the outside, right? But the problem is not with the fire. What's the problem? The problem is the fire doesn't have any parameters. And see, that's what I want to talk to you about today is there's nothing wrong with the passions that you have inside of you. The truth is God has placed all of that inside of us. God has placed the desire, uh, the, the desire to be sexually, sexually intimate with people. God has placed the desire to enjoy life. God has placed those desires in our hearts and in our minds. Those aren't the things that need to be suppressed or cut out or done away with. We just need to submit it all to the cross. Passions aren't bad. Check this out, what Galatians chapter 5 says. Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have nailed the passions and the desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Since we're, uh, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So what's he saying here? By when, when he says we've nailed it to the cross, simply what he's saying is we've taken every desire that we've had in our life and we've submitted it to the will of Jesus. It's not saying that we've completely done away with it. It's not saying that we've completely uh, suppressed any idea or thought that we've had in our minds. It's saying, Jesus, I'm taking every preconceived idea I've got. I'm taking every idea I have about sexuality. I'm taking every passion that I have, and I'm not saying let's throw water on the fire. Jesus, I'm saying let's take that fire and do something productive with it. Because I love fires. I've got a fire pit in my backyard. I've got a fireplace in my living room. And and at any point in time, there's probably all summer long, there'll be fires in my backyard. I love fires. But if I just lit a fire on this platform, I'd burn the whole house down. 
It's not smart. That's exactly what we do with the passions in our own minds, in our own hearts. We have these passions and we have the fire burning in our hearts and in our minds and we just light it everywhere we go and, and we, it's okay, there's no perimeters. Who's, who are you to tell me what to do and who are you to give me any ground rules and barriers of what I should and shouldn't do? And the truth is we light the fire and it starts all kinds of problems in and around our lives. And now all of the sudden, life is not what I thought it would be. Now all all of a sudden, it was just a cool fire to start with. Now I've burned the whole house down. And I want to give you some perimeters for our passions this morning. I want to give you an idea uh, of what the Word of God tells us on how to manage our passions. How do I walk in purity uh, in, in a world full of, of, of an idea that, go, that walks away from the plan of God? So if you turn your notes over, I want to give us some perimeters for our passions this morning. Number one is, is if I'm going to stay pure and I'm going to walk in purity, I've got to commit to God's word. I've got to commit to God's word. I realize that sex as I know it's been built, it's been sold to me and it's a lie. I understand that my passions aren't bad and I understand that purity is not bondage. It's actually, it's actually freedom. It's the opposite of what the enemy has built it to me as. So if I'm going to understand how to walk in purity in the face of all of that, I've got to commit to God's word. How can a young person stay pure, the word says, by obeying your word? Psalm 119 and 9. How can a young person stay pure? Here's the answer. By obeying your word. The problem is we don't obey God's word. We half the time don't really know what God's word really has to say on it because again, purity and God's word has been built as archaic and old and, and what God has to say about it really doesn't matter. But as believers, I want you to understand this. If you trust in Christ and you say, I'm trusting in him as my savior, you have to also trust in him as your Lord. And when you trust in him as your Lord, that means you're gonna submit to his authority in his word. And if you wanna walk in purity, you take your preconceived idea ideas and you lay them down and you pick up God's word and you say, God, no matter how I feel about it, no matter what I think about it, whatever that is, I'm going to lay that down and whatever your word says about it, that's what I'm going to do about it. How many of you are just tired of everyone's opinions? Everyone has an opinion, an idea of how things should go or, or ought to be. And the truth is we ought not have any opinions really as believers. If people ask me my opinion on certain ideas, my opinion doesn't matter. How I feel about a subject or, or a certain thing going on in life or in our culture, that really doesn't matter. But what God's word has to say about it, that means more than anything. And if I'm going to truly walk in purity, I need to realize that, that sexuality and all of those different lifestyles and things and all that different, those different ideas, it's all a lie as I know it. According to God's word, I need to pick that up and go, whatever it says, I'm committing to that. So I need to commit to God's word. Word. We've got to lay all of our ideas down and pick up his word. I heard a quote, I read a quote this past week from John Bunyan, and he says this either sin will keep you from the word, or the word will keep you from sin. I thought that was a powerful illustration of God's word. Either sin will keep you from the word, because it does. Anytime we're walking in sin, anytime we're walking in, in a, a lifestyle that we know is not honoring God, it's hard to pick up God's word and listen to it and pay attention to it. But it will either keep you from him or he will keep you, the word will keep you from sin. So we need to commit to God's word. And then number two, if I'm going to walk in purity, I need to manage my mind. I need to manage my mind. This one's huge, especially in our culture. I can't tell you how many conversations I've been in with people in my generation specifically who have told me that it just doesn't bother them to see things in movies. And it just doesn't affect them uh, spiritually or emotionally to read things in books or to listen to things in songs. They talk about just how good of a, a job they've done professionally and how good the musicianship is and how great the penmanship is and all this other different stuff. And, and, and they overlook the message that's being given to them. And we need to go back to scripture and understand who Job was and realize what the, uh, the, the, the covenants and the deals that David had to make in their own life. Listen to what Job said in Job 31. I have made 
made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. It was such a big deal that I've made a covenant. I'm not even going to, before I ever put myself in a situation to where it's a possibility, I'm already going to make the decision that it's never going to happen. Does that make sense? And then he goes on in uh, Psalm 101 and 3, I will refuse to look at anything vile and vulgar. I will refuse to look at anything vile and vulgar. What he's saying is, before I'm ever placed in a situation to where I have to make a decision in the heat of the moment, I'm already making a decision in my heart and mind that it's not going to happen. So is sexually, in a rela- if you're in a relationship, you're not married yet, you already need to, need to know in your mind how far you're not willing to go before you ever place yourself into that situation. Because if you ever get placed in the situation, you're not going to make a decision that honors God if you haven't first already made it in your mind before you ever get to that point. You need to manage your mind. You need to manage your media intake. There is nothing you can't tell me, like I just said, you can't tell me it doesn't bother you. You can't tell me that is the biggest load of crock. It doesn't bother you. You can't tell me that because what goes in is going to come out. You can't tell me that it just, that kind of music just helps you get pumped up to work out. That kind of, or that kind of stuff just causes these emotions it, because it is an emotional thing. It is a spiritual thing. Everything that comes in and you will come out. So if you're listening to music that's sexually explicit and talks about women in certain ways that they should never be re- referred to as, that's exactly eventually how you're going to treat people in your life. You don't need to, you don't even really need to allow yourself that kind of stuff in your heart and in your mind. Just go ahead and make a decision that I'm going to manage my intake. I'm going to manage what comes in and I'm going to allow God to control. I'm going to allow his word to dictate what I watch, what I listen to, who I hang around, the environment that I place myself in. If you're naive enough to say it doesn't bother you, I'm telling you, you've already bought into the lie and you're already caught. You're already there. You're one, you're one more decision away from stupid. You're one more decision away from adultery. You're one small decision away from making a decision that's going to cost you everything because you've already bought into the lie that it's not affecting you and it already has, it's already affected you. So you need to manage your mind. The TV you listen, the, uh, the watch, the music that you listen to, all of those different things, you need to manage those things. And then number three, I'll give you, if I'm going to walk in purity, you've got to magnify the consequences. You've got to magnify the consequences. You'll notice that these, these practical ideas, these go against everything that culture will teach you. They go against everything that the world will teach you. Complete opposite ideas, okay? Magnify the consequences. The enemy would, would like to tell you that it's not such a big deal. It'll be handled. It's okay. No big deal. As a matter of fact, the enemy's kind of found its way even into theology. And there's this thing I like to call cheap grace. And, and people think, no matter, no matter what I've done, no matter what's going on, I'll, God will just forgive me. I'll just ask for forgiveness later on this week and everything will be kosher with God. Proverbs talks about it in chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. It says, stay away from her. And he's talking about this immoral lifestyle. And he's giving this analogy of an immoral woman, a prostitute in the streets. And he's telling his son, don't even entertain the idea. Don't even entertain the thought. Stay away from her. Don't go near the door of her house. If you do, and listen to what, he gets some very sobering things that can happen. You will lose your honor and you will lose to merciless people, all you have ever achieved. That's a pretty sobering thought, isn't it? There's a possibility you will lose your honor and you will lose to merciless people all you have achieved. I think every person probably at least once a month ought to read Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. I think those, those books, right, those chapters right there are incredible reminders of what can happen in our life when we make decisions to walk away from the will of God. He's saying you will lose to merciless people all you've ever achieved. And we've, most of us have been there in some form or fashion in our life. We've made decisions, or maybe you're in a situation now where you're making these decisions and the enemy, uh, the flesh inside of you is trying to convince you that it's okay, that it's no big deal. Nobody's going to find out. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not bothering anyone else. It's just about me. But I'm telling you, the Bible says for us to walk away from it. Don't even entertain the idea. And if you'll magnify the consequences of what could really happen in your life, it'll help you walk in purity. I've got an Evernote. I was telling the first experience. I've got an Evernote notebook just to help me magnify consequences of things that could happen in my life if I do something so dumb that's gonna that could cost me everything. And I just write those things down. Maybe it's a 
good idea for you to do that. Write down the idea, the thoughts, the job that you could lose, the family that you could lose, the uh, relationships that could be destroyed, the, all of the different things that could happen. I remind myself every day that, you know what, if I make a dumb decision today, I'll have to tell my wife everything and I'll have to I've got a five-year-old now that I'll have to sit down and have a conversation about how dad couldn't control his own, couldn't control his own uh, body and thought and minds and made decisions that, were, uh, that destroyed our family. And, man, I've got to come to our church and tell our church what's going on. And, and then ultimately, man, I'll have to face God and let him know. And, and we've bought into this life, this cheap grace that God's just going to be okay with it. That God's just going to be okay with the decisions you make and don't worry about it. I love you anyways. And man, how much have we cheapened the grace of God? Do you not know that you're worth more than that? You're worth more than the cheap grace you're buying into. The Bible says that God loved you so much and the sin that separated us from God was so far from God that it took him paying purchasing us with the greatest value that could ever be used. He sent his own son to die on a cross to purchase our salvation back. So you need to understand you are far more valuable to God and to his son Jesus than you give yourself credit for. And I would, I would just encourage you to magnify the consequences of the value that God has placed on, on you and in your life. You are far more valuable than that than some cheap grace of, well, God will just forgive me. It'll be okay. He paid far more for you and far more for me than for us to, to, to lower ourselves to that level. We need to understand that our lives, our passions, our desires, those aren't bad things. They're parameters. A fire is awesome in a fireplace, but it destroys everything. It destroys everything it touches. This little bitty flame, it hurts every single time you touch it. It's not a time it doesn't hurt. That little bitty flame, it hurts every time. And when it's not given the proper respect and parameters, it will destroy everything it touches. And you need to magnify the consequences in your life to understand the reality of God's love and mercy that he would give us parameters for purity. And then number four, I'll give you the last parameter that you need uh, today for purity. How do I walk in purity? You need to allow accountability. You need to allow accountability in your life. And I say allow because here's the truth. I, I do lots. Of, I'm an accountability partner to lots of people, and I've got accountability partners in my own life who know everything about me. I've got friends in my life that know every password to everything I own. They could steal me blind, and I'd never even know it because they know everything. They know everything. There's nothing that I'm hiding. They have on my glass house. They can come look. They have authority in my life to speak into my life and to check on me at any point at any time because I need to know. I I need accountability in my life. I'm your pastor, and I'm telling you without accountability, I, 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 I will mess up. If I don't have people in my life keeping me straight, I'll mess up. I'll sin against God. I won't walk in purity. And you need to allow accountability because you're only accountable if you want to be. You're only held accountable if you really want to be. You could have every form of software uh, on your smartphone and on your computer, every form of accountability software. You can have giving everyone your passwords. You can have meetings every week and talk to people. You can go to the greatest degree uh, of what accountability should look like on the outside. But if you're not honest and you're not truthful, you won't be held accountable. You'll find some way around it. You're only held accountable if you want to be. And I'm telling you, if you want to walk in true purity in this life, you need to allow accountability in your life. Listen to what Proverbs 13 and 20 says this. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get yourself in in trouble. The Bible tells us, Pastor Brandon showed us last week in the book of James where it says that we need to pray for one another and we need to confess our sins to one another so that we can be healed. And if you're going to walk in purity in this life, you need to realize that everything you see around you in this culture, it's a lie. It's not truth. It's filled with lots of half-truths. There's, no, there's not a lot of truth in it. It's just enough to slip you away from a relationship with God. And you need to begin to allow those parameters inside your life. You need to begin to look at God's word and don't worry about what you feel about anything. And go to God's word and say, what do you say about it, God? And that's what I'll submit to. And you need to have accountability in your life. And you need to look at those consequences continually. And you need to understand that this is a battle that we face and it's not against flesh and blood. It is against spiritual high places and different things that you even think about in your life. And the enemy wakes up every single day with an idea that he's going to wreck your life. 
He wakes up every day trying to destroy you. But here's the cool thing. We've got a God who the Bible says we have a, 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 an advocate in Jesus who is continually standing at the right hand of the Father, completely fighting on our behalf. And he loves you and he cares for you and he wants to see God's best for you. That's the savior we serve. He died for you. So we need accountability in our lives and we need to be in small groups and we need to have software like Safe Eyes and Covenant Eyes and Triple X Church and those kinds of ministries. And we desperately need those in our lives and we need to have people who have the authority to speak into our lives and ask us hard questions. If you don't have that, then as a believer, shame on you. You need someone in your life who can ask you those questions. Husband, you need somebody who can walk up to you and go, hey man, you're not treating your wife good. I've seen how you guys are arguing and I've seen you. You need somebody to be able to speak into your life like that. Same way with you, wife, single guy. You need somebody in your life who can walk up to you and go, hey man, I've seen the decisions you've been making lately and that's not good. You need to, we need to talk about this stuff. Let's pray about it together and let's, let's confess some things together. If you don't have those things, you will fail. You will fail. Purity is not something we can do on our own because the enemy wakes up every day with a new idea of how he can twist it around and how we can pull us away from a relationship with God. And it's a battle that we're in. And guys, with the, with the power of Christ, the love of the Holy Spirit, and the community around us, we can conquer it. We can do it, but you'll never do it on your own. I want to pray with you this morning. Bow your head and close your eyes. And our worship team's going to come and they're going to play some music. And I just want to... There's really three responses to this message. I told you when we started today that it was really going to be more of a kind of a serious conversation like we were sitting in your kitchen at your kitchen table or at a coffee shop and we're talking about some straightforward answers from God's word. And really there's a couple of different ways that you can respond to a message like this and and what I've noticed in my own conversations and even on my own my own life decisions, the process that I've walked through my faith with Jesus in is I've probably walked through these all myself. And the first one is, is defensiveness. Lots of people are defensive when you talk about these ideas because this build in our culture is old and archaic and it doesn't work. And those are the old, those are the old days. And we need to get on board with what's new and what's, what's happening. And Let's be honest, the, uh, God's way is the only way that's ever been proven all throughout history to work. God's ways work and defensiveness, you can be defensive, but let's, let's just be honest. Look at our culture. Look at where America's going. Look at where all the other cultures before us have gone. Look at where we're headed and, and let's, let's, ask, let's answer an honest question. How's it really going? Not so good. Not so good. Another way you can respond to a conversation like this is you can respond in remorse. You can just feel bad for yourself and feel bad about the situation. And you say things like, you know what, he's right. Man, I've made some dumb decisions. I've been in some stupid relationships. Man, I've, I've, some, I've done some things that are so dumb. And man, how could God ever forgive me? And there's just nothing good in me. And it is what it is. And just feel remorse. And honestly, that's not going to get you anywhere. But there's a third option, and uh, the Bible teaches us about repentance. And there's a great verse in Scripture that tells us the difference between worldly sorrow and, and godly repentance. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. It says this. It says that godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. How awesome. How life-giving. How much of a fresh breath is that? no regret it says but worldly sorrow brings death so the way I said we've got a couple of different options today you can feel bad for yourself and you can walk away feeling horrible and never do anything about it or you can you can understand what's going on in your heart right now that godly sorrow that, that brings repentance and you can turn from your idea and you can turn from your preconceived notions and you can say God my way is not not, a, not good. My way's wrong. And I'm laying that down and I'm picking yours up and I'm, I'm walking in repentance. And here's what repentance means. It's simply this. It's changing your mind from your ideas to God's ideas. God, my way's not working. Clearly, it's not done any good. So I'm going back to you. Jesus, I'm accepting you. And you're accepting him as your savior, but you're also accepting him as your Lord. And you're giving him authority to speak into your life. 
So today, if that's you and you've, you're, you're here, maybe you're here for the first time and the truth is you don't even really even know if you've accepted him as your savior ever. He's never been your Lord because really you've never accepted him as your savior. You've lived your life by yourself on your own with your own ideas and it's really not leading to anything. And today you need to start a fresh relationship with Jesus Christ. And nobody's gonna look, look up, nobody's looking at you, nobody's gonna come and get you or embarrass you. I just wanna lead you in a prayer this morning. If that's you, just slip your hand up. I need a new relationship with Jesus. Come on, I see that hand, that's awesome. I'm proud of you. That one in the back, I see that one, that's incredible. Best decision you can ever make. I need a relationship with Jesus. And maybe you're here this morning, you say, man, I've got faith in Jesus, but if I were honest, man, I'm living outside of the parameters and that fire, man, it's, it's getting dangerous. I'm not living a life that honors God and I'm making some decisions that I'll be honest with you, if people were to find out or if, or if I were to, uh, uh, I'm, I'm one more step away from burning the whole house down and I need some parameters in my life and I need to recommit myself to God's standards. If that's you today, just put your hand up. I'm gonna pray with you. It's a testimony of just, hey, I see those hands in the back. Those are awesome. Right back here, I see that one. Thank you. Those of you that just raised your hand said, I need a fresh relationship with Jesus. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer right where you are. You can pray this. It, it, honestly, here's the deal. It's nothing that I'm gonna say that's gonna, that's gonna do anything. It's your heart change. It's your commitment to Jesus. So Father, I thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Today, I just confess my sins to you that the decisions that I've made, they've not been decisions that honor you. And we confess those and we lay them today at your feet. And today we pick up your grace. Jesus, I confess today that I realize that I am more valuable than I've ever placed on myself. I realize that you paid a high price for me. And today, that. and I commit to follow you as Savior, and I commit to follow you as Lord. And today, according to your word, I am changed. Father, I pray your blessing over every person who just said that prayer. God, we accept your salvation. And from this day forward, we are new. Your word says all those that are in Christ are new creation. All old things are gone. Behold, all things are new. And God, we pray favor over that new life, that blessed life. God, I pray that you surround them with people who love you. Surround them with accountability in their lives. God, I pray that they begin to understand what real life really is. And God, we commit to live a life on purpose for you. God, those hands that just raised and said, I'm committed, but I'll be honest, I need some parameters and I need to recommit my life to Jesus. God, I pray that you would just begin to touch their hearts and begin to show them the relationships that they're in that need to stop, the, the stuff that they're doing that needs to stop, the parameters that you're placing in them is for their protection, not for their restriction. And I pray that today they walk out of here with fresh vision for their life from you. They walk out of here with a fresh idea of the life that you've called them to live. And God, we'll give you praise for everything you do. We celebrate your goodness and your your mercy. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Come on, church. People just said yes to Jesus. That's the greatest celebration we can have. Yeah.